So thanks for joining us. My name is Laura Wright. I'm a housing attorney with the Virginia Poverty Law Center. And, and with me today is Amy Diesel Allman with the Virginia Legal Aid Society and Sarah Black with the Legal Aid Society of Eastern Virginia. Today we're going to go through um, some of the current tenant protections that are in place, as well as resources to help folks get caught up on rent and pay off utilities, and some of the new laws that will be going um, into effect on July 1st. Um, after doing that, I'll stop the recording and we'll open things up for some Q&A um, to hear a bit more about your situation, things you're seeing, and answer any questions you may have. Um, if at any point during the presentation you have a question, feel free to put it into the chat box and we'll try to get to those questions as we can. Um, at this point, I will turn it over to Amy. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Amy Dyson-Allman. I'm the Director of Advocacy for the Virginia Legal Aid Society. Um, we cover, I actually work out of the Suffolk office and we cover um, Central, South Side and Western Tidewater. All right, so um, it's important to remember um, under Virginia law, these three things are always true. Uh, your landlord cannot cut off your utilities, lock you out, or take other actions to deny free use and enjoyment of your home. Um, this is, doesn't happen as often as it used to, but there's no, we call these an illegal lockout. They can't turn off the utilities, they can't change the locks, or do something else to deprive you of, of using the property. If they do, you can file something in general district court called a petition for relief from unlawful exclusion. Um, and you know your local legal aid will be able to give you some advice about that. There's a form on the court website for that as well. You, uh, the second thing is you do not have to move out just because your landlord tells you you have to leave or files an eviction case against you. That is just the beginning of the process. Um, a lot of people think once they get that letter or once they get the notice from the court that they have to move out. Um, they do not have to move out until and unless a judge issues a uh, judgment and possession against them in court. Uh, third, a landlord must wait until they win in court and the sheriff has a writ of eviction before um, they can remove you from the property. And so again, like I was speaking about before, in order to actually properly legally remove you from the premises, they have to wait until they have that judgment and the, the court has ordered possession. Then they go to the sheriff, they go to the court clerk, get what's called a writ of eviction, and the sheriff actually brings it out and serves it uh, on the tenant. And that's what we always tell people when they get that writ of eviction, that's when you know when the real D-Day is that you have to get out by. It'll generally be 72 hours. It gives you a date and a time you have to be out by. If they're not out by that time, then they can be physically removed from the property and their belongings can be put on the street. All right, because of the pandemic, there's a lot of uh, temporary uh, protections that were put in place, both uh, federally and statewide to uh, prevent evictions during the pandemic. Uh, the big one was the, or is the CDC eviction moratorium. Uh, that came from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Probably heard about it in the news. Uh, the point of it was to allow tenants who fell behind in rent because of COVID um, from, or actually it could be for anything, but tenants who have fallen behind on rent uh, to keep them from being evicted until after June 30th, 2021. So it's been extended a few times. You've probably heard about that in the news, but the date that is in place now and that we do not expect to be extended is June 30th. Um, an important thing to know, a lot of people don't realize it's not an automatic moratorium. You have to take affirmative steps to avail yourself of, of this protection. And so there's um, specific things that a tenant needs to do to make sure they are protected under this. Um, and so these are the categories of people that can get help under it, under the eviction uh, moratorium that will fall under it. Tenants who are unable to pay rent because of a large loss of household income or high medical expenses. Tenants who would likely become homeless or have to uh, double up with friends families if evicted, like couch surfing, staying in a, you know, 
in a place where there's other families, things like that. Uh, tenants who make less than $99,000 a year, uh, or if it's a, a couple, if it's family, $198,000 a year for a couple. And the tenant needs to be facing an eviction for not paying rent. And the tenant must have done their best to get government assistance to help catch up their rent. And they have to meet all five of these categories to fall under that uh, federal eviction moratorium. All right, so these are the requirements of what they need to do. Uh, again, it's not automatic, so these are the things they have to do. Um, we always tell people, because it's part of the uh, declaration I'm gonna talk about down here, it's part of the requirements. Uh, a tenant has to continue to pay as much rent as you can. Um, we, we tell people a reasonable amount. Now, that can be interpreted many different ways, but um, I always tell people, do the best you can without uh, causing other harm to yourself with not being able to get medication, not providing uh, other you know, food for your family, things like that. Um, but pay what you can, even if it's a nominal amount, it shows good faith and it makes sure that you comply uh, with the terms of the eviction moratorium. Uh, two, um, apply for government rental assistance, document your efforts. Um, it's important that the tenants have met that fifth requirement on the previous page, they've got to have reached out to try to get some sort of rental assistance um, prior, to, prior to this or during this, I should say, it can be both. Um, and then we always encourage people to document their efforts just so they can say um, that they've done it. I haven't had that come up yet with any clients, but I always tell people be prepared for it. Um, third and most important is there's a declaration form down here with the link at the bottom. They need to print or get that declaration page, sign it and give it to their landlord. If they do not give it to their landlord, then they cannot um, fall under the protections of this and prevent the eviction until June 30th. Um, they can do it at any point during the eviction process. We always encourage people to do it as soon as possible. Um, if they're we always encourage people with anything, you know, when they want to document things with a landlord or any type of uh, legal matter, if they can send it certified mail um, to wherever they send their rental payments, um, that is ideal. So you have proof that it was given. And then of course, uh, a copy to your landlord by hand if you can, or leaving it, you know, wherever you normally leave things from them. Make sure they keep a copy of their records. It's very important that again, you have a copy of that declaration that you, you filled out. Um, another thing that comes up sometimes depending on the timing of things, that CDC declaration can be given to the court. If the, court, if the case is already in court, that can be given to the, the judge to be able to show that they're availing themselves of that protection. Um, it can also be given to the sheriff. If let's say the, the case has gone all the way through and the sheriff has it um, with the writ of possession, it can be given to the sheriff in different Sheriffs are doing things different ways, different courts are doing things different ways. So it's important for uh, any tenant to reach out to uh, legal aid or some other type of assistance to make sure they're doing it correctly. All right, these are uh, some of the new Virginia tenant protections that were passed as a result of COVID um, and the state of emergency. They were in place, the time period was January 1st was when they went into effect and they are good through the end of the COVID state of emergency, which at this time has been uh, told by, by uh, Governor Northam is June 30th. Again, these, June 30th is an important date. Um, so until June 30th, these criteria go into place um, and that'll apply to any cases that have been filed before June 30th. Um, the landlord cannot evict a tenant for unpaid rent unless they do these things. First, they have to give a written notice telling you exactly how much you owe. The notice has to have these two requirements in it. It has to give you 14 days to pay what you owe. Um, that's basically, we call it a a cure period, 14 days for you to be able to catch up um, and, and stay. Um, and it also has to have information in about uh, the rent relief program. 
Um, it's an important program that's in place, and we'll talk about it more, where people can get rental assistance. And so they're required to put specific language in their notice that has that so tenants know that they can, can use that. Um, and also it has to have the 211 Virginia information in there. That's the, the main number for the state that people can contact for all kinds of help and that will point them to the rent relief program. Um, the second uh, requirement that they have to meet before they can evict for unpaid rent, um, the landlord has to apply for the rent relief program on the tenant's behalf within 14 days of sending that notice. Um, the times that you do not have to do that, that the landlord did not have to do that is if the tenant's paid in full, um, if they've entered into a payment plan with the landlord, um, that's another one that would make them not have to apply for the rent relief program. Or if the tenant has told the landlord that they've already applied on their end. Um, again, we're gonna talk about this a little bit later, but the rent relief program has a tenant side that can be applied on and a landlord side that can be applied on. And this is the landlord side that tells you whether or not you have the, the landlord needs to apply under this law. Um, the other thing that a landlord cannot evict for unpaid rent is if re unless re rent relief is denied for one of these reasons at the bottom here, uh, because the tenant refused to apply for rent relief program or refused to cooperate with the landlord when they applied. Um, the rent relief program was denied by the agency um, and they've been, they've been told they don't meet the qualifications or are ineligible for rent relief. If the application is not approved by the, uh, by the rent relief agency within 45 days after it was submitted. Um, an important thing about that 45 days is it has to be the complete application. It's not just the first time they send it in. That has to be all the documents that have to be submitted from both the tenant and the landlord. So that 45 day clock doesn't start running until it's officially complete and in the process of being reviewed. And the, the last um, thing would be if the rent relief program runs out of money and when that happens, but that we are, absolutely nowhere near that. They have a ton of money left and we are in very good shape for, for the rent relief program to continue for quite a while. All right, this is a, another really important one. And um, this one last past June 30th, thankfully. Um, not forever, but last past June 30th. So if a tenant has been sued for unpaid rent, um, and they have a court date. When they go to that court date, first of all, always tell tenants and, and if you're the tenant, make sure you always go to court on the court date. You do not wanna miss the date or you will get a default judgment against you. If you go to the court on the scheduled date, these are the, if you meet these certain criteria, you can ask the court for a 60 day continuance of your case. Um, the reason that's important, um, it doesn't make the eviction case go away but it buys you an additional 60 days to be able to get rent relief program assistance. If you don't qualify for that, to be able to enter into some sort of payment plan, you know, basically to negotiate something with your landlord so you can prevent the eviction. Um, in some cases, that's also a move out if the tenant chooses to do that and you can avoid that eviction uh, judgment on their record by having that additional time. But most importantly, we wanna keep people there. Um, in order to get that 60 day continuance and qualify uh, for that new protection, these are the criteria. You have to have lost income uh, because of the COVID-19 pandemic. And again, you have to be sued for non-payment of rent. Those are, are two important qualifications that they have to meet. Uh, a heads up over here on the right hand side, I always tell people, make sure you bring written proof about your lost income. Um, if you don't have it at that court date, many judges will continue the case for two weeks to have the tenant bring in documentation to show that they have in fact lost income due to COVID. 
um, and due to COVID is very important. If they just lost income for some other reason, they don't qualify for it. And if the judge finds that out, it's always a bad thing. You do not want that to happen. Um, over here on the right are some different ways um, that, that someone can prove that they lost income due to COVID. Uh, a pay stub showing loss in earnings, um, a furlough notification you know, during the beginning of the pandemic, there was a lot of that if they have that at any point. An essential employee status letter saying that they were non-essential. Um, and the other one, which is, it is probably the one we use uh, a big percentage of the time. We have an affidavit that's available on the Virginia Legal Aid or on the legal aid website for the entire state. There's an affidavit that you can use that says you meet these criteria and that you have lost income due to COVID, but you don't necessarily have some sort of written documentation of it. You're basically signing and swearing that you that it's the truth. Um, and that is good enough for the court in most cases. I always tell people, be prepared. The judge is gonna ask you some questions about that and make sure it's valid. Um, so again, those are really important. And the other big thing that people often get confused about this, uh, understandably, is they, it does not have to be, they don't have to be unemployed now to be able to get that, eight, that uh, 60 day continuance. If at any point during the pandemic, since the start of the pandemic, they have lost income because of COVID, even if now they're in a good position and back at work, they can still use this. It doesn't have to be an ongoing thing. So I always encourage people make sure that you, you use that if you can. And this protection is gonna last um, until September 28th. So at least we get a little bit more time with it. All right, payment plans. Um, this is an option for tenants who rent for larger landlords, uh, who rent from larger, larger landlords uh, if they have five or more properties, and if they're behind on the rent payments. Um, it starts uh, July 1st, 2022, um, and this goes through all the steps of that. If the tenant falls behind on rent, the landlord has to offer the tenant a payment plan. The tenant has 14 days to either pay in full or agree to enter into the payment plan. If the tenant does not do either, the landlord can then file an eviction. And again, that'll be important because those are things that have to happen before the landlord can even file the eviction. If they don't do that, that's grounds to get it dismissed. Uh, next, the payment plan has to allow the tenant to pay the total amount due in equal monthly installments over a six month period. Um, if there's less than six months on the lease, the payment period is for however many months are left on the lease. Uh, the landlord cannot charge late fees during the payment plan period as long as the tenant continues to make those payments on time. And as long as the tenant continues to make full on-time payments, the landlord cannot evict the tenant. Um, and if the tenant does miss a payment, which you know can easily happen uh, for people that are working paycheck, living paycheck to paycheck, the landlord has to send a new 14 day written notice before they can file the eviction. Um, and just to note on this as well, this is available regardless of whether or not you've lost income due to COVID. This is the protection that got put in place last fall um, and it'll be effective through July 1st of next year. So this is available to anyone who's behind on rent and is getting, um, gets that pay or quit notice for not paying rent. So you don't need to show that you've lost income due to COVID or had those high expenses. This is available for anyone who's renting from those larger landlords who simply is, has fallen behind on rent. Exactly, thank you, Laura. Laura is our expert on all of the new, the new protections. She has, has helped all of us learn them quickly. Um, okay, evictions from hotels and boarding rooms. This is uh, often a big thing for our clients. A lot of uh, our clients, um, live in motels, live in hotels, live in boarding rooms. Um, and, you know, if they do that, there are certain protections that apply um, if a person that is staying there, if they stay in that hotel, motel, or boarding room 
for more than 90 days. If they've stayed for more than 90 days, these different protections kick in. Um, first of all, it has to have been there, you know, again, it has to have been their primary residence for 90 days, or they have to have some sort of written lease for 90 days. Um, and then you get that protection just like you were in a, a regular house or an apartment. If it's illegal for the hotel to try to evict you without a court order and the sheriff. So they have to do just like every other landlord does in that situation. They have to go to court. They have to file an unlawful detainer, which is an eviction action, and you know, then get the sheriff involved if they, they win in court. If the eviction is for non-payment of rent, the hotel has to give a written 14 day notice before filing, uh, before filing that in court. The notice has to tell them how much they owe and give 14 days to pay uh, what's owed or the hotel will uh, end the, the lease or reservation depending on which one it is. After the 14 days are up, the hotel has to file the unlawful detainer, the eviction case in court um, in order to properly evict someone. But again, that, that 14 day period has to happen first. For residents that are have stayed 90 days or less, let's say it's somebody that's been in a motel or boarding room for less than 90 days, uh, for 90 or less, they um, don't get those same protections. The landlord can evict them without taking them to court. If that's been their uh, primary residence during that time period, the landlord does have to give them a written five-day notice of non-payment before evicting the uh, tenant, basically just saying you have five days um, to pay this. If it's not their primary residence, the landlord can evict them without notice at all. Great. Uh, thank you so much, Amy. At this point, I will turn it over to Sarah with the Legal Aid Society of Eastern Virginia to talk about some resources available. Great. So my name is Sarah Black. I'm from Legal Aid Society of Eastern Virginia. I am the Deputy Director and Director of Litigation. We cover Norfolk, Virginia Beach, Portsmouth, the Eastern Shore, Hampton, Newport News, Gloucester, Matthews, Middlesex, Williamsburg, and James City County as well as Picosin. Um, so that's us. Um, the first thing I'm gonna talk about today is the Virginia Rent Relief Program. Um, this is a very well-funded program that provides assistance to both landlords and tenants who have experienced a loss of income due to COVID. Um, you can get, uh, rent arrearages dating back to April 1st, 2020, up to 15 months. And starting in July, it can cover 18 months of rent. It can also cover three months of prospective rent uh, going forward from the date of application. The program will pay everything covered under the lease. Okay. Pardon me? Okay. Uh, Sarah, can um, Can also cover, uh, let's see, where was I? The program will pay everything covered under the lease, including utilities and late fees. And assistance is also available if you're in public or subsidized housing or receiving a housing choice voucher. Um, this is not a loan. It doesn't have to be paid back. All payments are directly to the landlord. Um, now I'll go through these eligibility criteria, but I will say on the Virginia RRP website, there is a link that you can click um, if you're a tenant and you're wondering if you're eligible. And you can answer a series of questions um, to help you determine if you're eligible uh, for this program. And so if you think you are, I suggest going to the link for sure um, and taking that little quiz. Um, so you need to have a lease in your name or other documentation showing there is a landlord tenant relationship like a rent statement, a text message agreement or a late notice. Just something that shows that, you know, this person is your landlord. You have to have experienced a loss of income or increased expenses during the pandemic. For example, you were laid off, your hours were cut, your place of employment closed, 
you had a loss of child or spousal support, or you had to stay home to take care of children due to daycare or school closure, or you're unable to find work due to COVID, unable to work due to the high risk of illness from COVID, or you have increased medical expenses or increased um, work expenses from working at home. Your rent has to be at or below 150% of fair market rent. And you have to have a current household income that is 80% of area median income. And that is going to vary, you know, by geographical region. Um, and it will also depend on your family size. Um, so how to apply. And I'm gonna go through this and we'll hit this in another slide, but for both Virginia Legal Aid Society and Legal Aid Society of Virginia, um, do offer assistance to tenants in applying for rent relief. So I am gonna go through these, but just know that we also do provide this assistance um, with these applications. So you apply online, um, we've given you the website, you can apply by phone, um, there's a way to check the status of your application. And here is the quiz. Um, if you're not sure you're eligible, there is this little quiz you can take and it is super handy. And it does look at things like, you know, do you income qualify? Are you 80% of area median income? Because it has you list out, you know, if you lived in Norfolk City or you lived in Accomack, you know, you would, you would state that in the quiz. So the quiz is super helpful. Um, landlords are also able to apply on behalf of tenants through Virginia Housing. Um, and so we provided that information as well. Um, so again, here is what I referenced before. Both Virginia Legal Aid Society and Legal Aid Society of Virginia offer assistance to tenants um, who need to apply for RRP because it is kind of a little bit of a complicated uh, application um, where certain, you know, things to prove income um, are required. Um, I also think it's maybe easier to get a landlord response if you have some help applying for the program because sometimes the landlords um, are not the quickest in responding to their tenants um, for this. So landlords can also go to home um, in order to apply for assistance directly for their tenants. All right, so Virginia Legal Aid Society has this handy thing you can scan. You can go to their app and you can scan this code and you can uh, find out what rent relief you're eligible for. Um, we have nothing so fancy at Legal Aid Society of Eastern Virginia, um, but I will say it's not up here. Um, starting July 1st, you know, we provide contemporary, contemporaneous representation at public and subsidized housing dockets. Um, so we will be back in court. Those are on our website at www.lasheva.org, um, a list of where we are um, for the housing dockets. Um, so starting July 1st, when the moratorium ends, um, we expect all of our, and I think Virginia Legal Aid expects this too, the public and subsidized housing uh, landlords are going to start filing evictions again. At any rate, there is a regional crisis hotline which covers um, both our service area and Western Tidewater. Um, and the number is 757-587-4202. Um, Virginia Beach residents, um, the city of Virginia Beach sort of manages everything in a uniform way. You can go to virginiabeachrelief.org or you can dial the connection point number 757-227-5932. Um, Portsmouth residents have their own number as well. Um, I know in our service area, and I assume this is probably true in Amy's as well, um, if you are a tenant and you are facing eviction and you know, you've exhausted all of your resources, you really have to call the housing crisis hotline first before you try to contact anything additional within your city. All the cities now are really running all their assistance through the housing crisis hotline. Um, 
which is run, you know, by four kids. Um, for Williamsburg, James City County and Upper York County, um, the United Way um, is providing a lot of assistance. And so we would suggest people in that portion of our service area to look um, directly at the United Way Community Resource Center. As well, for the South Side, there's resources757.org. All right, utility assistance. Um, the moratorium on utility shutoff is gonna be ending at the end of August. So it's important to try to get on top of things now. Um, and this is actually also true of anybody who has a back balance in rent. Um, the time to act is now, don't wait till you get the unlawful detainer. Um, it's better to be proactive to contact legal aid or Virginia legal aid, depending on where you live um, and try to apply for rental assistance and work out a payment plan. Um, the same is true of utilities. It's really important to get this sorted out before August 29th um, when um, the moratorium on shutoff ends. So you can ask your utility provider for a pay payment plan that works for you before August 29th. You have the right to a 24 month payment plan and um, you can decide on an amount that you can afford to pay every month in addition to your regular utility bill. Um, so you should really, you know, I think the suggestion is for tenants to be aggressive about asking for a payment plan um, and one that they can afford. There is also like, you know, varying city to city, there is assistance um, for utilities. And utilities covered by your lease, the Virginia Rent Relief Program could help you pay those. Um, if your bill's too high, you do have options with DHC, DHCD, Weatherization Assistance Program, and you can also contact your local utility provider on how to reduce your energy costs. There is a Virginia Poverty Law Center utility helpline at 804-313-9363. Thank you so much, Sarah. Um, and it occurs to me that August 29th is on a weekend. So I would make sure that you're reaching out to your utility provider that Friday before, because you don't want to wait until Sunday when they're closed to reach out to try to get on a payment plan. Um, so next I, um, real quick before you start that, I'm a huge sure. uh, rent relief program fan. So I jotted down a couple of extra things that I've uh, experienced that we've had experience with lately with it um, that might be helpful. Um, on the rent relief program, they will actually pay in addition to the rent, the back rent back to April 1st, they will pay any court costs if someone's been sued in court, they'll pay late fees, they'll pay all of those late fees, they'll pay attorney's fees. Um, there's a lot that they cover that other programs do not cover. So um, I always encourage people see if you qualify for the rent relief program first. Um, if you can and you do, like I said, there's a much bigger pot of money, um, a huge pot of money to pull from with that. And um, they also cover all of these things that sometimes um, are not covered in some other programs. But of course, the other, all of the programs that Sarah mentioned are, are terrific resources. Um, the other thing is, the, uh, if a tenant is, if either a tenant or a landlord are denied, uh, a lot of times we hear people saying that they've been denied rent relief program. Um, they get something, they see that they qualify, they meet the qualifications, um, but they apply and they'll get something that says denial, either an email or when they log onto the system. I always uh, caution people that is not, if you qualify for the program, if you meet the eligibility requirements on that website that, that Sarah uh, mentioned, that one where you can see if you're eligible, if you meet those income qualifications and your landlord is doing their part, you're doing your part and submitting the documentation, that denial always has to be pushed back on because that denial is not a real denial. It's a, the documentation you submitted is not sufficient. We need something else. 
And that happens all the time, even as attorneys, when we're helping submit them, they will ask for something different. They want it on slightly different, you know, paper. <laughs> they want something that we didn't provide that is not a real denial. Always, always, always go back on that. And if you are not able to do that yourself as a tenant or a landlord, make sure you reach out to somebody that can help you with that. Because again, again I don't want anybody to lose uh, lose out on those funds when they are definitely eligible. Um, there's no reason to be denied if you meet those eligibility requirements. And I will um, say, finally, yeah. yeah, sorry, Amy. I will say that um, at Legal Aid Society, we definitely would help somebody appeal a denial from a DHC, from DHC's rent relief program. Um, so if you were qualifying for our services, which at this point is, um, if you're facing eviction, um, up to 200% of the federal poverty level, um, you know, you would be eligible for our services. And this is a kind of thing, a kind of service we provide um, if you were denied. But I think also to Amy's point is um, both my program and Amy's program help people apply for this. So if you're a tenant, you might want to seek that help and you would have a less, you would be less likely to be denied. Anyway, sorry, go on, Amy. Oh, that's exactly right. And uh, one final thing on the, the app, that little thing on the few pages before, and our paralegal did the QR code. I had no idea what a QR code was. So she found that and put that in for us. That all you have to do is scan that with your phone and it'll take you directly to the website. Um, but it can be used by anyone in the state. Um, any location, anything else, any tenant or landlord can use that and get information. Uh, tenants can get information on the different legal protections that are available to them, some of which we just went over and some that uh, Laura is about to go over. And it will also direct them and we'll see if they qualify, we'll tell them if they qualify for the rent relief program or some other type of assistance and point them, it gives them a report at the end that points them exactly to where they need to get help, what they need to get help with. And um, we encourage people, if you don't know where, where you're at, if you don't know if, if you're in the legal aid services of Eastern Virginia uh, area and you know, you, you're not sure to call them directly, if you call that 866-534 number, uh, 5243, that covers the entire state and they will direct you to the proper legal aid office. So um, we really encourage people to do any of that. And if any of you are providers and you would like a flyer that has that app information and those links and everything, I'm happy to email that to you directly or print some out and, and send them to you. Um, and there is a question in the chat, I believe from someone who issues um, housing subsidies. And I know Amy, you are just, um, Okay, and this is someone who receives HUD funds to pay clients rent amount directly to the landlord and the client uh, pays their portion directly to them. And there is, uh, they're asking about um, for tenants who are really behind on paying this intermediary, can they submit rental rent relief applications on their client's behalf for that portion of the rent? Um, so I would say maybe. Um, the way the rent relief program is worded and the regulations and everything that, that put it in place and Treasury Department of Treasury has certain guidelines and things like that, um, it specifically says, says landlords. Um, you know, landlords are the ones who can apply and get funding or the tenant applies for it to be paid directly to the landlord. But if this is a situation where um, the client is now in debt to you and needs to pay you back for it, it's, it's possible. I mean, I would reach out to uh, Virginia Housing and Department of Housing and Community Development. You're welcome to email me directly and I can point you to the right place. It's possible you could ask them about it. That's very out of the box, but they've been very responsive to unique problems that have presented themselves that they hadn't anticipated. And the goal is to, to keep people in their, in their homes and to not have a giant balance that they can never pay off. So um, it's possible if, if they were to tell you no and you can't, then I would definitely say, depending on what your, you know, I don't, I don't know what all your, your status is and what you have to do with the money and everything else, 
but it might in those cases be better to refer them to the rent relief program first because that's not going to be something they have to repay at all. It's not a loan. They don't have to repay it at any time. So they might be in a better position using the rent relief program. I would probably reach out to home directly and um, in your situation because it is, you know, more of an unusual fact pattern. Yeah, and like I said, don't hesitate to email me. I can give you their, their direct information. They're good about responding. Great, thank you both so much. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and move on and quickly cover these new landlord-tenant laws that are going to affect starting July 1. Um, the first of these is changes around the right of redemption. So this um, is something that got put into place a few years ago that allows you to pay everything that you owe um, including the rent, any late fees that have accrued, course costs, attorney's fees, and if there's already been a judgment, then um, sheriff's fees. Uh, if you pay that off, um, you can stay in your home. So starting July 1st, there are some major changes around how this right of redemption applies in Virginia. Um, the first one is that there will no longer be a limit on the number of times that tenants can exercise their right of redemption. Previously, you could only use it once per um, 12 months in a lease term, um, starting July 1, you can do that any number of times. There is an exception for smaller landlords, so those small um, mom and pop landlords who own four or fewer units. Um, they can limit that to one time per year, but they have to give you advance written notice um, if they're going to do that limitation. Um, additionally, landlords will be required to provide clear language explaining the right of redemption in that pay or quit notice. That's the notice that the landlord sends you if you fall behind on rent that tells you how much you owe, when you have to pay it by. Um, now it will also be required to include information um, explaining that right of redemption. Um, this is to make sure that tenants understand that if you make a partial payment, that, that, that's not enough to avoid um, a judgment against you. Um, there will be language on DHCD's website that landlords can use. They're putting together a model notice. So you don't have to come up with that language yourself. It'll be on DHCD's website. Um, additionally, um, if you have a tenant you know, who's wanting to pay that off, they can send in a written request to the landlord to ask for that amount. And the landlord has to give it to you. That way that you're both on the same page about how much you owe, including any of those late fees or court costs that have already occurred um, that you can pay in order to cancel the eviction. Additionally, if that tenant successfully redeems, they pay everything they owe, the landlord must cancel the eviction. You know, even after the court has entered a judgment for possession, as long as that tenant has paid everything they owe at least 48 hours before the scheduled sheriff's eviction uh, the, and the landlord gets that money, they have to cancel the eviction and they have to get the judgment mark to satisfied. Um, this is a really critical piece because, you know, if any judgment that's still floating out there saying you owe this party money, um, you know, they can come back at some future point and use that to garnish your wages. So we wanna make sure that if you're paying everything you owe, paying off that judgment, that, that gets marked as satisfied. Um, additionally, if, you know, the landlord gets that money and for whatever reason they don't cancel the eviction and the sheriff ends up kicking you out, that's considered an unlawful exclusion, um, which is something Amy talked about at the beginning of the presentation that you know, they can't illegally kick you out. And that's really critical for um, the piece I'll talk about shortly. Um, and that's with some changes around unlawful exclusion. So if you have a landlord that uses a self-help eviction, either they go in and change your locks or they do something to make the home unsafe and unlivable to stay in, um, or if they cut off essential services like water, electricity, um, that's illegal. Landlords cannot do that. They have to go to court, go through that court process in order to evict you. Um, now, if the landlord does use these self-help measures, um, you can sue that landlord in court using that tenant's petition for relief from unlawful exclusion um, in general district court. Um, there's a simple form you can fill out on this available on the court website. Um, and once you file that, that court is going to be required to schedule the first hearing within five days. Um, you know, previously when tenants were filing these, some courts were scheduling it out for weeks 
out, sometimes even, you know, for as many as four weeks. And so you had families that were locked out of their home illegally and were having to pay for hotel. Starting July 1, um, they have to get, the court has to schedule those within five days. Um, and BPLC's, uh, bplc.org, you can go there to get more information about how to do this. But I strongly encourage you to reach out to your legal aid if you're in the situation um, to help you get that filing together, uh, you know, negotiate with that landlord to let you back in. Um, it'll just go much smoother than you trying to figure all this out on your own, which is a very, you know, stressful time as is. Um, one of the changes as well is that if the court finds that the landlord illegally locked you out, um, you can get $5,000 or four months rent, whichever is greater, and statutory damages. Um, statutory damages is really important because you can get this even if you don't have any paperwork showing expenses you had to pay due to being locked out. This is basically a penalty against the landlord for doing something illegal. Um, hopefully, this will be a really good deterrent that if you do have a landlord who's threatening to change the locks or come shut off the water, you can say, if you do that, I'm going to go to court and I can get $5,000 in damages. Hopefully, that'll be a helpful negotiating tactic. Um, in addition to that $5,000, you can still recover any actual damages, you know, any expenses you incurred because of the illegal eviction. So if you got locked out and you had to go stay in a hotel for a couple nights, make sure you keep those receipts um, and bring those with you to court. Um, another change that goes into effect on July 1st has to do with when a landlord can enter your home to do routine maintenance. Um, starting July 1, landlords have to give you at least 72 hours notice before entering the building. Um, previously, it was only 24 hours, so this gives you a bit more time uh, to figure things out. Um, however, if, if you're the one who requested that maintenance, they don't have to give you that 72 hours notice because you've essentially given them permission to be there. Um, another change is that during a state of emergency based on a health pandemic, um, tenants can provide written notice to the landlord that they don't want any non-emergency maintenance conducted. So, you know, this is really important for those who are immunocompromised or have health concerns and don't want to risk a spread of illness in their home. They can, you know, put in that written request to the landlord to say that we don't want any non-emergency maintenance. Um, there are some exceptions to that because, you know, property owners have different insurance policies and loan agreements uh, that require them to do routine maintenance, but they can only do that once every six months. Um, and they have to give you seven days prior written notice before doing that. Um, and they can only enter at a time consented to by you, the tenant. And, uh, you know, they also have to wear any PPE equipment required by state law. Um, so this one, um, it's for any health pandemic. As um, Amy and Sarah mentioned earlier, the current COVID state of emergency is going to expire on June 30th. So unfortunately, these protections won't be in place um, before that state of emergency expires. But if there is, you know, COVID 2.0, um, these protections will be available. Um, and lastly is, I know really important for the Tidewater region where we have a lot of service members, and that is that landlords can no longer require you to waive your rights under the Service Members Civil Relief Act. Um, this is a federal law that applies to men and women serving in the armed forces that provide certain protections uh, because you can get called up for active duty or deployed at any time. Um, you need to be able to break your lease or if you get sued to delay that case until you're actually there. Previously, landlords in Virginia were including a waiver of those rights in the lease agreements, um, but starting July 1st, they will no longer be able to do that. Uh, so, you know, they can't include that lease provisions, which is important because, you know, one of the things that federal law provides is that you can get a right to a continuance um, of any eviction case filed against you. Um, so this is a really important change for our service uh, men and women. Um, before we go into um, any questions, here is uh, information for the legal resources. Uh, we have the Eviction Legal Helpline. If you're facing an eviction, you can call that, get brief legal advice, um, or you can reach out directly to 
um, Legal Aid Society of Eastern Virginia, Virginia Legal Aid Society um, to get direct services. Um, you can also apply for direct services at their website stated here. Um, and you know the Virginia Poverty Law Center, we have a website with just basic um, landlord tenant law information if you just want to find more. And at this point, 